Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church, and Merry Christmas. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Great day, GBBC. Thank you for coming in and joining us right now. We are worshiping and praising God. Guess what? This is the third Sunday. And we are celebrating the birth of our king, the reason for the season. So I need you right now, bring your family in, call whoever you need to call on the phone. I need you to hit that share button, start a watch party. I need you to like, comment, subscribe. Let us know that you're in the building. You know, go ahead and leave us a comment. Praise the Lord. Amen. During certain sections of the of the program, we want you to be involved. We're at home, but we're not alone. We're still worshiping the Father together. So why don't y'all come on? Let's get the, get our families together, get our friends together, and let's praise the God that we serve. How many of you know that Jesus is a wonderful child? Come on and let's bring in this holiday season with some praise and some worship. Hallelujah. Hey, it's all right to clap. Give God a little rock. Praise the Lord with me. Hey, hey, hey. 
Good morning, GBBC. This is the day the Lord has made. We give God praise, glory, and honor for this Christmas Sunday, Sunday, December the 20th, and we just give God praise. Were you not blessed by our mind ministry and their phenomenal presentation along with our worship team getting us kicked off? Well, listen, I want to just personally welcome you to our worship on today. Of course, this is December and Pastor takes a little break in December and our associates do a phenomenal job on today. Pastor Sonja is going to bring the word. She currently leads our children's ministry among other uh, ministries in our church and she is a, just a wonderful jewel and gift to our body and we praise God for her. But along with her today, we have for his glory dance is going to bless us with a wonderful ministry following my opening here. And then watch this toward the end of the service, our very own sexophonist. I like that word, a saxophonist. Brother Robert Holbert is going to bless us after the message for today. Well, listen, get buckled in. Let's have a time of glorious praise to our God. And let me just lead us off with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your glory towards us. We thank you for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has come to this world to be God with us. And Father, we glorify you for the gift you presented in him. And Father, we receive the gift joyfully. We're so grateful that our salvation is secure through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, we invoke your presence into this place. We thank you for the worship that's gone forth. We thank you for our mind ministry, Romans 12, 1, getting us ready. And now, Father God, as we continue in this worship experience, we want you to be glorified. Father, have your way. Move as only you can move. Allow our hearts to be knit together in both unity and the spirit. And we're going to give you glory in advance for how you choose to bless. In the name of Jesus, we pray, praise you, and honor you. Amen. Oh, praise God. Bless his holy name. Now we're going to be blessed by our For His Glory dancers, and we're going to continue on this worship and give God the highest praise. Come on, give God a hand right where you are, right there. Come on, let's go.
You want to know what joy sounds like? Just listen to the sound of children laughing. They see something that they think is funny and they just laugh and laugh like there's nothing wrong with the world. Doesn't matter if they just lost a game or fell down some stairs or was told something mean. They just let themselves go and laugh. I think that's a bit of what the kingdom of God is supposed to be like. No matter how bad things get for us here and now, Jesus came to give us life full of joy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Sometimes we forget about joy this time of year. I mean, we know it's supposed to be joyful, what with the singing and the feasting and the presents. But when the bills come in and we've heard the same songs over and over and some of our guests outstay their welcome, it can seem like the season of joy is more work than it's worth. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's you and I take a minute right now as we light this candle and remember that none of the things that drain the joy out of Christmas are really what the holiday's about. It's about the joy of being in the presence of the light of God himself, of singing with the angels because our God has come to earth to be with his people. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Just remember that this week. Whenever you get the holiday blues, or the holiday I can't take it anymore, stop and think about that little baby who came into the world to save you and me. Let that soak in for a few minutes. And I'm sure you'll start to feel a glimmer of the joy of Christmas. Jesus. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Christmas Sunday, Christmas service Sunday. It's also third Sunday, of course, so that means it's our, our youth and you've seen them praise and worship the Lord. Grab your scriptures and turn to Mark 6, 1 through 6. Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. And while you're doing that, I just want to give honor to the angel of our house, our senior pastor, Stephen Brown, thanking him for this opportunity to serve you today and giving honor to our, our leadership, our executive leadership, core leadership team, the leadership of GBBC, and of course you, the members. We love you so much. In Mark 6, starting at verse 1, it says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with the disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all of this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. I want to tag this text today, Tis the Season. Tis the Season. The big idea would be no faith, no joy. No faith, no joy. That's N-O, no faith, no joy. No faith, K-N-O-W, no joy. 
Our expectations can bring limitations on people or on God. Jesus works in the realm of faith. His birth was accomplished and surrounded in faith. He freely limits or expands himself based on our expectations and belief in him. That then has the capacity to limit, create, or even, even sustain joy within us. Whether times are good, whether times are bad, whether times are happy, or whether they are sad. A Harvard social psychologist did a study of children to see how they would respond to expectations. All the children in one San Francisco grade school were given a standard IQ test at the beginning of the school year. The teachers were told the test could predict which students could be expected to have a spurt of academic and intellectual functioning. Then the researchers just randomly drew names out of a hat and told the teachers that these were the children who had displayed a high potential for improvement. Naturally, the teachers thought they had been selected because of their test performances and began treating these children as special children. And of course, the most amazing thing happened. The spurters spurted. The gains were most dramatic in the lowest grades. The first graders whose teachers expected them to advance intellectually jumped close to 30 points. And the second grade spurters, they increased on the average of 20 points more than their peers. One little child who had been classified as mentally challenged with an IQ of 61 scored 106, all because there was an expectation and someone exhibited faith in what they could do. Our expectations and faith in a person or a situation have a dramatic impact on the results, whether it's in the natural or in the spiritual realm. Now for a Christmas Advent message, it may seem a little strange to use the gospel that doesn't start with the birth of Jesus or doesn't include the birth of Jesus. The overall structure of the book of Mark is more geographical than it is genealogical. Mark gives us his recollection and his interpretation from Peter's point of view of Jesus' travels in and around Galilee as well as in and around Jerusalem with two stops to his own neighborhood. The main key to understanding Mark's gospel considers the which is considered the first canonized gospel, is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Mark's major theological emphasis is the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. For Mark, above all, Jesus, 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 he's trying to get us to see, is Adonai. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the Christ. So I guess you can say that, you know, he does get into a little bit of genealogy. Because as we take a look at today's passage surrounding the village where Jesus was from, I want to start with that place of Nazareth. Verse 1 says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. He had just finished raising the dead of a 12-year-old girl. And then he went to his childhood city that was considered to be a very common place, not, not really worth mentioning. It wasn't the social or the cultural place in its day. It wasn't the happening city. It was about 80 miles north or 80 miles from Jerusalem. It's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. Nazareth is not even mentioned by the historian Josephus. It's not even mentioned by or in the rabbinic literature. The town was so obscure that a church wasn't built there until the 4th AD. 
Now, today, it's a very large city uh, north of Israel with about 75,000 residents. But in Jesus' day, there was only about 400 to 500 people. And some say that it was even less. According to the Gospel of Luke, Nazareth was the home village of Mary, and it was also the site of the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel informed Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. And according to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus or Joseph and Mary resettled in Nazareth after returning from the flight from Bethlehem to Egypt. Now, this may explain the skeptical and negative attitude experienced by Jesus when his first declared, or he first declared himself in Nazareth as the Messiah of Israel. How on earth could the world's long-standing hope emerge from such a small, common, unknown, humble village as Nazareth? Even when Peter, or when, excuse me, Philip, went to tell Nathaniel that, that, that he had found the very person that Moses and the prophets had wrote about, and his name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth, Nathaniel responded, can any good thing come from Nazareth? The town just wasn't significant enough to have a great leader or teacher come from it. Now, along with coming from his miracle tour, if you will, from raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, Jesus had also healed a man possessed as a demon or with a demon. He had also healed a woman with the issue of blood. And now Jesus has come into his own country, the city of Nazareth. Why why did he go to, to Nazareth? Maybe it was a familiar place. He was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. He had lived and worked among the people. He knew, they knew his family and and his family lived there. After all, it was his home town and it could possibly have been dear to him. But it also could be or could have been a favorite place. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had returned to Nazareth since the beginning of his public ministry. He had been there early on in his ministry. And Luke tells us that as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, during this first visit, the people got so upset with him and so mad that they wanted to throw him over a hill and kill him, but it wasn't his time. He wasn't received well then, and yet Jesus returned in that third year. Although they rejected him once, he loved them, and he wanted to minister to them. He wanted to serve them. Aren't you glad that his love and his care for us doesn't depend on our attitudes, on our actions, on our affections? Despite our shortcomings and despite our faults, despite our mishaps daily, he continues to care for us. Thank you, Lord, that your gracious love exceeds our failures today, even as it did back then. Now, this leads us then to the people of Nazareth. The same adjectives to describe Nazareth, plain, ordinary, and common, could also describe Jesus. It is with this cloak of humility that Jesus goes to the synagogues again, and as the custom, when he goes into the synagogue, he began to teach. Many times he's found there teaching and answering questions to the leading minds of that day and to all who would hear. The B part of verse 2 says, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all of this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? I mean, they were astonished. They were amazed. The Message Bible says they responded like this. We had no idea that he was that good. How did he get so wise all of a sudden? And how does he have such great ability? They had never seen, they had never heard anything like this. 
the Jewish people, they had great scribes and great scholars and, and rabbis, more than any people of that day. But here is this unlearned, untrained miracle worker waxing so elegantly and, and, and intelligently with death and, and with wisdom. In appearance, he seemed to be common. He seemed to be plain. He seemed to be ordinary, but that's not what he sounded like. And they were having trouble connecting the two, dealing with this tension between what they saw and what they heard. They were comparing him to the best of the best, but in what Jesus said and how he said it, he was distinguishing himself as a teacher, head and shoulders above the rest. He was also presenting himself as a rabbi with the disciples accompanying him. And the people of Nazareth just could not wrap their head around it. The people of Nazareth, they had a great opportunity. They had the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from who John says in the beginning was the word. And he was expounding on the word. He was expounding upon himself. They had this great privilege. It had been given to them, but, but they had blown it the first time. And here he is again. He's back once more. They had a great opportunity. On the other side of glory or this side of glory, we don't have that opportunity to sit physically at Jesus' feet. But every time we come into the Lord's house, and I know that was more post-COVID, <laughs> Every time, though, now during COVID, we come on the parking lot on the first Sunday. Every time we tune in virtually on, on Wednesday, Bible study, kickback with PB. Every time we listen to the podcast, every time we tune in to service, we're sitting at the feet of Jesus. We have the opportunity to sit at his feet every time we open up the scriptures, every time we open up the word. We have the written word that reveals the living word through the direction of the Holy Spirit. The people didn't realize the magnitude of the opportunity that they had, and unfortunately, sometimes we don't either. We make the same mistakes over and over again. We, we can't get it right. We can't make the right decisions. Why aren't my relationships, we sometimes ask. Why are they so strained? And why do I only have momentary happiness based on what's happening in my life? And I don't have any real lasting joy. Well, we learn from the people of Nazareth that it's lost opportunity. And oftentimes that occurs as an indication of our spiritual maturity or a lack of. They were amazed. They were astonished. Surely it had to be evident somehow that Jesus was the divine. After all, they knew his mother, Mary. She was from their town. They had somehow or should have gotten an inkling that he was not an average man. And as I mentioned, they had heard his teaching before. They just got so upset that they wanted to kill him. And no doubt they had heard about his teachings uh, throughout Galilee, maybe even witnessed his miraculous works. But then, in a split second, they went from minds being blown, spellbound at Jesus' teaching to the next minute they were questioning his authority. Their spiritual condition wasn't mature enough to receive the words or the work of Christ. They were insistent in not accepting him as Savior. Sad to say, many Christians fail to enjoy a victorious life because of spiritual immaturity. But the text is moving. In verse 3, they say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, of Joseph, of Judah, of Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Oh, they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. So now they go from a missed opportunity to immaturity to uncertainty. You heard it said before, if you can't say anything good, if you're in doubt, keep your mouth shut. They missed that. Jesus wasn't recognized as the Messiah. They had the opportunity or they had the attitude of, of, of who does he think he is? After all, he's just a carpenter. He's just a craftsman, a builder, working not just with his hands, but also with tools. 
See, even in that statement, they were trying to belittle him as just manual labor. Then they say, isn't he the son of Mary, the brother of those who live here? Now, when they said he was the son of Mary, they really had gone just a little bit too far. Because in Jewish culture, you refer to a child by his father's name. Some say that maybe Joseph had passed away at this point. But when Jesus had returned from the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit, and he went into the synagogue in Nazareth, that was the first time when he went, and he found the place in the scroll that they handed him in Isaiah, and he read about the prophecy of the anointed one, and he was trying to tell them that, that he was him, that, that this is me, I am he. They said, how can this be? Isn't that Joseph's son? So they said it then, but, but now it's a different story. They were really just trying to be nasty. Because if truth be told, they were trying to question his legitimacy. See, there were some questions. Yeah, oh, you're saying that it's Joseph's son, but I, we, don't, we, we, we don't really know. We don't know who that boy father is. We don't know who his daddy is. They were trying to belittle Jesus. On top of rejecting his position of authority, they tried to insult him as a person. Man, does that sound all too familiar. If we can't override your position and disavow whatever qualifications or experience you have, then we'll attack you as an individual to bring you down. Jesus was already, though, being an example of that John Maxwell leadership principle that you never lead from a place of position but from a place of passion because no one can ever take that from you. And there'll always be a place for you to express your passion, to influence others when you live out your passion because out of passion becomes purpose. And we see Jesus living his best purpose-driven light, which was to teach. We learn from the Gospels that that was Jesus' main ministry, one of being a teacher. But after making those remarks, they were also, or by making those remarks, they were also trying to rob Jesus of the deity he possessed because they couldn't accept the man they knew as the son of God. Hopefully, none of us would ever deny Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one. And if you're hearing the sound of my voice, I pray that today, as soon as possible, quicker than right now, sooner than at once, you will put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. To not do so is robbing him of his deity. And then you, once you put your faith in him, you need to put your trust in him because trust in his ability to meet your needs. For many of us, I know, I know, this pandemic yeah, has taken our trust to a whole nother level. <laughs> Some days are harder than others if you're like me. A big part of my prayer each day is now just, Lord, I trust you. And I believe that you have a plan. So I'm relying and leaning on you every step of the way. I'll be honest with you. I've kind of stopped praying, Lord, lead me and guide me. Because at this point, I'm just following. <laughs> <laughs> I know times like this can make us want to go our own way, want to do our own thing because we're scared and we're unsure. But that's denying Jesus' deity. Whenever we refuse his will for our lives, whether it's his perfect will or his permissive will, we are denying Jesus' deity and his sovereignty. It's important to remember that Jesus... Jesus isn't a God who is far off, unaware of our needs. But Psalms 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Hang on to that scripture. Hang on to that verse. Now, in verse 3, we see that they become offended. In the Greek, it is a derivative of, of, of scandal, scandalized. They're, they're, they're thinking that, you know, Jesus is causing a scandal because they can't believe, they won't believe that this common, 
this ordinary, possibly illegitimate man is schooling them. And even so, if Jesus is teaching as he had been, I'm sure that he was telling them that he is the hope that they longed for, the joy they are missing, and the peace that they needed. But their response was, I don't think so. And now look at verse 4. Jesus flips the script, <laughs> and he calls them on the carpet. You see now the accountability of the people. Verse 4 reads, then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives, even his own family. Jesus would, you would think that Jesus would have enjoyed a fruitful ministry in Nazareth because of the family connection. He calls out the people, he calls out his relatives, and he even calls out his immediate family. If you, if you know your Bible, you know at one point earlier, uh, his family had come to take him away. Jesus and his disciples, they were so busy performing miracles that they didn't even take the time to eat. And when his family heard about it, they, they came and wanted to take him home. Well, Jesus didn't address it then, but he's addressing it now. They thought he had lost his mind. They had witnessed his works. They had heard his words, and yet they still rejected him. He was received in other places, but not in his hometown. They would be accountable, though, for the light they were denying, just as we will as well. And this rejection created a major problem for the people of Nazareth. As we've looked at the place of Nazareth and the people of Nazareth, this brings us to then the problem of Nazareth. The attitude of the people in the Nazareth created a major problem that was threefold. There was a lack of fruit, there was a lack of faith, and a lack of focus. In, in verse 5, we see that, and because of their unbelief. He couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. The lack of fruit, yes, Jesus is sovereign and he will accomplish what he desires, but we have an impact on his work. Our doubts, our unbelief can hinder the work of Christ and it can be contagious. If we never show genuine faith, then most likely those that are around us, others will never show genuine faith as well. And boy, does this ring loud at home for me. As the pastor overseeing children's ministry here at GBBC, it's why I labor so hard to get parental involvement. If your kids see your faith, alive and growing in the Lord, then it will affect their faith. They'll grow more likely in their faith. But if they don't see your faith, any evidence of it or growing faith, then it's quite possible that they'll be lacking in faith. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't ever come to know Jesus or they won't ever grow in their faith. But what I've learned and what I've seen in my experience is they come dragging it with a whole lot of baggage behind them. There was also a lack of focus. The work Jesus performed in Nazareth was limited to healing only a few sick people. A small number of physical needs were met, but it doesn't appear that any spiritual needs were addressed. I so hate to admit this, but it kind of sounds a little like modern times. It seems as though we no longer have a burden of revival. We're not interested in a real close walk with Jesus. We kind of got one foot over here in the world and one foot over here uh, in the church, and we're, we're straddling the fence between, between the two. We're not interested in seeing souls saved. Much of our emphasis is on physical needs, and trust me, I, I'm, I'm for meeting the physical needs of people and of the body, but it seems our evangelism has been replaced with entertainment. 
our burden has been taken over with boredom and our worship has been exchanged with personal works of activities and programs. We've got to get our focus back. Somebody say, get our focus back. Pandemic or no pandemic, we've got to get our focus. We've got to get our focus back. And then we see there was a lack of faith. In verse 6, the first part reads, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He, meaning Jesus, he was amazed at their lack of faith. They were his people. They were his kinsmen, and yet their faith was weak. He would have expected this from Roman Gentiles, but not from his own people. There are two things the Bible tells us that Jesus marveled at. He marveled at Jewish unbelief and Gentile faith. We never read that Jesus marveled at art or architecture or even at the wonders of creation. He never marveled at human ingenuity or, or invention. He never marveled at the piety of the Jewish people or the military dominance of the Roman Empire. But Jesus did marvel at faith when it was present in the unexpected place and when it was absent where it should have been present. So I'm just asking for a friend. Would Jesus marvel at your faith or at your unbelief? A little faith goes a long way with the Lord. The Bible says if we have faith of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. They, 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 they had it right when they referred to Jesus as Mary's son. She believed the angel Gabriel right off when he announced to her that she had been favored. She had been graced among women to become the mother of Jesus, the son of the most high. When she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who also believed and was graced in her old age with a child, Elizabeth greeted her with, how am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? She believed. You are blessed, she told Mary, because you believed the Lord would do what he said. The shepherds believed when, when, when Jesus' birth was announced to them. The angel Gabriel said, exclaimed, I'm bringing you good news that will bring you great joy to all people. Because the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born and you will recognize him by this sign. He'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. The, the shepherds looked at each other and said, let's go see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Jesus had, had come not once, but twice to the people of Nazareth to let them know that he was him, that I am he. They had so much evidence, so much more than Mary, than Elizabeth, and, and the shepherds. They had Jesus in the flesh. But you know what? We have to ask ourselves, are we any better than the people of Nazareth? Because we have him within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And still, our faith is feeble and fickle. One commentary said it like this. God may work with no belief but not with unbelief. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't let that be you. You may have to cry out. You want Jesus working in your life, so you may have to cry out like the father of the demon-possessed boy. I do believe, but help my unbelief. As we move through this Christmas season and we start to prepare for 2021, I just want to encourage you with three short things and then we'll be complete for the day. If you're finding yourself overwhelmed or shaky in your, in your faith, there's a lot going on around us and maybe you're unsure, then number one, increase your faith by focusing on the promises of God. God is not a man that he should lie or son of man who changes his mind. Does he speak and not act or promise and not fulfill as we're told in Numbers 23 and 19? No, God promises are rock solid. They are not forgotten. They are not forsaken. God made a promise of a redeemer. 
for our sins way back in Genesis at the beginning. And he fulfilled it in the birth of Jesus Christ as we're preparing to celebrate that this week. But then the promise was complete through the death, burial, and resurrection. So increase your faith by focusing on the promises of God. And then get your, get, get your hopes up. Stir your hope by focusing on the character of God. God is truthful. He is unchanging. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is ever-present, and he is completely good. I want to challenge you to, to, to discover his character as revealed in the Bible and in the life of Jesus. As, as a matter of fact, take some time and pick up the rest of this story. And read the rest of the passage here in, in Mark. It's a common theme in the scriptures to don't stop on six. If God would have stopped creating on the sixth day, we wouldn't have a, a, a Sabbath. If, if, if the children of Israel would have stopped going around uh, Jericho, then the walls would not have fallen. Don't stop on six. So don't stop at this sixth verse. As you continue, you will see the last part of verse 6 and on into 7, that Jesus didn't stop. Even though he was rejected, he went right on teaching others. He went right on from village to village, from town to town. See, the miracles, they missed out because the miracles weren't for Jesus. The miracles were for their faith. But since they didn't have faith, since they didn't believe, since they had malice in their hearts, since they despised Jesus, then they missed out. One might make the case, really, that the trip home with Jesus and his disciples was actually the last lesson Jesus wanted to teach his disciples before sending them out. He perhaps wanted to show them what rejection looked like and how to handle it. He wanted to let them know that don't get deterred when you're knocked off course, even when it's encountered from those who should know you best. When opposition comes your way, keep on rolling. Instead of letting it depress you, let it redirect you. It's easy to get caught up in the hoopla of a crowd, people singing your praises that don't really know you and you really don't know them. That's why I don't really like Facebook and all that stuff, Instagram, because you got people waxing elegantly and doing all this stuff and people liking it and making comments and they have no idea what you really like or who you really are. But what about when the ones who are supposed to know you, supposed to be closest to you, turn their back on you and they disrespect you, your work and your word, and they don't give you their support? Jesus showed them, and he showed us exactly how to handle it. I do hope that you'll make a commitment today to deepen your personal relationship so you can experience the faithful character of God and all that he has for you. There is no situation that God cannot solve and there is no question that God cannot answer. Focus on his character. Get, get, get your hopes up on what's to come. And then lastly, to experience the great joy that the angels told the shepherds that would be to all people then focus on the goodness of God. Can somebody say amen? The goodness of God. The angel didn't say the people. That typically refers to the people of Israel only, but he said to all people. And that's really what outraged the people of Nazareth. On Jesus' first visit, I would hazard the hunch, as my, my, my childhood pastor would say, that on his second visit, Jesus followed up that point that he had come to bring salvation to all people. And by God's grace, Jesus feels that promise. He brought the good news and he fulfilled the good news because he was the good news. The root of joy is a relationship with the promise keeping God in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. We have the presence of God through his Holy Spirit. That alone should put a pep in our step, a gleam in our eye, a dip in our hip. 
that should give us peace of heart, of mind, of body, of soul, despite what's going on, despite our situation, despite our circumstances, because joy is not a perky personality issue. It's not a positive attitude situation. It has nothing to do with how you feel, but it will change how you feel. According to the scriptures, joy is the settled inner confidence that God's promises are true, that his presence is prominent, and God's control is absolute. As the song says, tis the season to be jolly, but only if you put your faith and your trust in the belief of Jesus. If there is no faith, there is no joy. But if you know the Lord and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then you know faith and you'll know joy. It doesn't matter what problems you encounter, no worries or disappointments, no unfulfilled dreams, no sicknesses, no obstacles, no disappointments, no heartaches, no troubles, not even coronavirus ah, can take it away. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Tis the season, Lord, to be jolly because Jesus has come. Lord, don't let us be like the people of Nazareth. Don't let us doubt. Don't let us stand in, in disbelief. But help us, Lord. Help our unbelief that we stand in faith. We stand in purpose. We stand on his word. Because Jesus is that word. Oh, Father, we thank you. We love you. And all that agreed say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, then I just want to take a minute to walk you through. Because all you got to do is just bow your head. And you don't even really have to bow your head. Just say, Father, I open my heart. I open my mind. I open myself. And I place it all in your hands. I believe that Jesus was the Christ. He is the Messiah, the chosen one. I believe that he died. And that he rose from the dead. And now he sits in heaven at the right hand. But before he left, he said, I'm going to release the Holy Spirit to live inside and guide. So, Father, I'll open up my heart to receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I believe in you. And that's it. Welcome to the family. <laughs> Do us a favor and call that number that you see on the screen. Because we love to put a Bible in your hand if you need it or serve you, help you, give you the right hand of fellowship, get you in a class to learn, to grow, to train. We got a new members class. I mean, we'll find a place for you to serve. We, we love to have you. Here's a place that you can, you can grow. Just call that number or text that number on the screen and somebody will get back with you. In Jesus' name. Now, before we go, don't shut us off. Don't click us off. We have one more special number by Brother Robert Holbert. So stay tuned and enjoy Silent Night.
continuing worship with the offering it's time for the offering everybody where you are say praise the Lord you know our pastor has been asking for a very special offering this Christmas after all it's Jesus's birthday so this is a great time for you we have four different ways that you can give um, you can uh, send it in you can mail it you can bring it by the church you can definitely give online you can text us to give however you want to get it to us then we'll receive it but it's time for the offering praise the Lord what a wonderful day it's been thank you so much for being here with us and from our heart to yours from our home to yours we want to wish you a very very happy and joyful Merry Christmas Merry Christmas from the Browns God bless Merry Christmas Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all and a happy new year. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas from, from Team Baxter. Baxter.